Due to an administrative glitch last June, the title of my talk, The Origin of Life, was somehow not communicated to the FQI, XI Secretariat. Uh, and so I find myself embedded in a session on free will, talking about the origin of life. But I have a good excuse, because my problem, hard though it is, is much more tractable, I believe, than the problem of free will. And so far, at least, the only examples we know of entities that exercise, or apparently exercise, free will are living entities. So in order to get to free will, you've got to get to life in the first place. Uh, so uh, with, with that preamble, uh, let me say that, as most of you know, in 1944, Erwin Schrodinger famously asked the question, what is life? And we're still asking that question today. If you go and talk to a physicist or a chemist, you'll be given an account of life based on things like matter, force, energy, reaction rates, molecular binding aff affinities, and so on. If you talk to a biologist, you get a very different description of what life is about. Biologists will talk in terms of instructions and transcription and editing, translation, coding, signals, instructions, and so on. So we have these two parallel descriptions of what living organisms are doing. And you might think, well, how can physicists and chemists and biologists work in the same university and get on with each other? Aren't they somehow in conflict? Well, uh, the answer is no. Uh, we regard these two types of description as running in parallel and somehow consistent with each other. And all that is fine until we have to deal with the problem of the origin of life, because the origin of life means a transition from the world of physics and chemistry into the world of biology. Now it's clear that biologists are using information speak in order to characterize life. Uh, physicists are using uh, mechanical terminology. And so the problem of explaining life, life's origin, in my view, is the problem of how to get a p very particular type of information storage and processing that I'm going to talk about to come out of uh, stupid atoms and molecules banging around. Now, everything I have to say has been carried out in collaboration with my colleague Sarah Walker, and I wish Sarah was the one here giving the lecture. Uh, the reason she isn't can be seen here. Uh, like me, Sarah is a theoretical physicist, and she likes to say this is her only experiment with the origin of life. Uh, the paper you'll see here uh, contains the gist of our thinking and the take-home message is that we believe that life is essentially about the organization, flow and management of information. I'm going to try and make that clearer. Um, I'd like to thank the Templeton World Charity Foundation for now supporting this work. This was the basis of it and we now have ramped up and we have a large research program at Arizona State University. Uh, supported by that funding. Now we're not alone in thinking that the key to life lies with the management of information. Paul Nurse, the current president of the Royal Society, uh, it's difficult, I know, for you to read, so I'm going to read this out for you. This is a paper in Nature a few years ago uh, on life logic and information. Focusing on information flow will help to understand better how, well I can't read it, how uh, organisms work. Let me, let me read the longer quote. We need to describe the molecular interactions and biochemical transformations that take place in living organisms and then translate these descriptions into the logic circuits that reveal how information is managed. This analysis should not be confined to the flow of information from gene to protein, but should also be applied to all functions operating in cells and organisms. So what are the informational hallmarks of life? I've listed a few of them here. Uh, you may want to add your own. Uh, the first thing is uh, digital information storage. Now, uh, during my lifetime, most handy gadgets have gone digital from analog. Uh, of course, we had the digital computer uh, even as long ago as when I was a student. Uh, but then uh, along came things like uh, digital watches, 
Uh, that's an analog watch, actually, uh, but you know what I mean. Digital watches, digital radio, now digital television. So we're all persuaded that digital information processing has advantages. When nature went digital three or four billion years ago uh, in the form of uh, the way information is stored in DNA. Uh, but there's a lot of analog, the, the information doesn't just sit there, it's processed, that's the key thing. Uh, and it's processed both digitally and in an analog manner through chemical reaction networks. This information, as I explained in my opening remarks on the first day, uh, is critically, is encoded information, that is, it's context dependent. Ask a biologist what is a gene, you'll be told a gene is a set of instructions for something, for example, for a ribosome to make a particular protein. Uh, so it's instructional information. Take DNA out of a cell and put it on the lab bench. It's stranded, it doesn't do anything. But put it in the context of a cell and it can be read out and make a difference. It does something. And that context dependent dependence has come up a few times already in the discussion at this meeting uh, and I'd like to try and make it a little more precise. So that's a really important property of biological information. The other thing that uh, has struck us as important is the fact that in cells, physical, the information storage is physically separated from where it's processed. So the DNA stores the information, but it's processed somewhere else in the cell. Uh, the dynamics of biological systems, unlike in physics, where the laws of physics are fixed, immutable, uh, universal mathematical relationships, in biological systems, the laws, or if you like, the rules, the dynamical rules by which they uh, evolve or behave, uh, change not just with time, but with a, as a function of state. And so that's something that we're very unfamiliar with, how to model systems, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this later, how to model systems where the dynamics depends on the state. So the founding dualism of science as we know it, going back at least to Newton, is that we separate out, on the one hand, timeless, immutable, eternal, unchanging laws, and on the other hand, contingent, time-dependent states. That disappears in biology if we want to describe it at the macroscopic level. It doesn't disappear if you want to describe it, say, at the quantum level, but at the macroscopic level it does. Uh, and this is related to the subject of top-down versus bottom-up causation, which is crucial to what I'm going to tell you, uh, and has come up again already in discussion. So the origin of life is really the uh, three origin puzzles in listed uh, together in one. There's the when. When did life begin? Well, uh, the fossil evidence suggests that it was firmly established on Earth at least three and a half billion years ago. Uh, where did it begin? We don't know the setting. It's fashionable to suppose that life began in a hot, deep location, perhaps deep under the ground and perhaps at a, a temperature above 100 degrees. We don't know. We don't even know that life on Earth began on Earth. It could, for example, have begun on Mars and come to Earth by this mechanism. I think the picture says it all, an impact ejector. Uh, and I think I, I quite like that idea. Uh, but, but the main problem is the how problem. How did life begin? And that's what I'm talking about here. Uh, well, what do the experts say? Uh, Francis Crick, a while ago now, uh, was so puzzled about life's origin uh, that he described it as almost a miracle, so many of the conditions necessary for it to get going. And when I was a student, that was the fashionable view, that life was a stupendously improbable chemical fluke, and therefore almost certainly unique to Earth. Uh, today, the pendulum has swung, and so Christian de Duve, in his book Vital Dust, says life is almost bound to arise wherever physical conditions are similar to our planet Earth. And in fact, he has this ringing phrase, life is a cosmic imperative. So here we've gone just during my career from life being a bizarre fluke at one end to being almost inevitable, built into the nature of the universe at the other. And the scientific facts haven't changed. We're still just as ignorant about how life began now as we were then. Uh, this, uh, of course, plays out in the uh, press all the time because of the discovery of many Earth-like planets 
in other star systems. And people make estimates, of course it depends on just how Earth-like we're talking about, but you'll see uh, news, news reports like this, uh, billions of Earth-like planets in our, in our galaxy. Uh, well, whatever that number is, uh, it makes a very little difference because a habitable planet is not the same as an inhabited planet. And a lot of people conflate those two terms. They think if a planet is Earth-like, well then it should have life on it. Uh, that is only the case if the emergence of life from non-life occurs with reasonably high probability. But if we don't know what brought about that transition from non-life to life, then of course we can't say anything at all about uh, whether a habitable planet is inhabited. Uh, so this just makes the point again, uh, if we don't know the process that transforms non-life into life, uh, then there's nothing that we can do to estimate the probability it's going to happen. And so people, I had to take a great interest in SETI, I actually chair a bizarre body called the SETI Post Detection Task Group. So I tell people that if ET calls on my watch, I, I'll be the first to know. The fate of the galaxy will lie in my hands. Uh, and uh, so people often say, well, how likely is it, do you think, that there's intelligent life out there somewhere? And I say, well, to have intelligent life, you have to have life. And we don't know how non-life turned into life. And if we don't know how it happened, how can I give you the odds? So therefore the error bars are infinite and I can't say anything at all. I was disappointed with that answer. Uh, and they take it to mean that I'm sceptical about life out there. Well, I'm not ske I'm sceptical one way or the other. We just don't know. Uh, right, this is a, a, a comment that is often made. Um, now, we may never have a blow-by-blow -blow account of how life began on the early Earth, but we would settle just for being able to say, was it a bizarre fluke or is it a chemical inevitability? We just want to know whether uh, we are freaks or whether uh, we, we, in some sense, represent uh, a process which is built into nature at the fundamental level. Uh, Darwin... Uh, Refu famously refused to be drawn on the subject of how life began. He told us how life evolves, but he wouldn't say how life began. It is mere rubbish, he said, thinking at this time of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter, which is a curious comment because we can now explain the origin of matter, uh, but we're still pretty stuck on the origin of life. But I think everybody agrees that somehow there was a, a chemical pathway, that is a mix of non-living chemicals, uh, somehow driven by some sort of energy gradient, somehow uh, transformed itself into a primitive living thing. And we don't know what those dot dot dots are, and we don't even know how long they are. But if uh, we think that life is based on chemistry, and it started with a chemi chemical mixture, and you want to know how life began, it seems to make sense to go and ask a chemist. Um, uh, can you cook up life in the lab? That might give us some uh, indication. Well, the first attempt to do this, as I'm sure you know, was made by Stanley Miller, a student at the time, inspired by a lecture by Harold Urey, uh, and he, put, he tried to recreate the conditions which, at the time, were believed to prevail on the early Earth by putting some gases in a flask and sparking electricity through it uh, for a week and succeeded in making amino acids. And everybody thought this was really great. This was the first step on the road to life. Uh, but let me show you the next picture. This is uh, just a portion of what is called uh, intermediary metabolism. And uh, biologists, um, who are g clever people, have worked out all of these, uh, these horrible steps here. And, and you might think, well, how do we know there's not a mistake in that little red dot there? Uh, we, we, we take it on faith that they've got this right. Um, and this just gives you some idea of the stupendous complexity of just a small part of life. Now, we don't know what is the simplest living thing. Craig Vent is trying to make it. Uh, but uh, it's clear that the simplest autonomous cell, not counting viruses, the simplest autonomous cell is already stupendously complex. And so Stanley Miller, well, he's now the late Stanley Miller, but his colleagues would need a very big budget indeed, I think, to get this far uh, in, uh, in my lifetime or your lifetime. Uh, and so, um, can we uh, find analogies elsewhere? Well, we can. We look at a computer. A computer is a pretty clever sort of thing. It does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and uh, this is a screenshot of my computer 
a few months ago, uh, contains a couple of familiar objects. There's one there and one there. Uh, and uh, this is Windows, as I'm sure you know. And you might say, well, what is the secret of Windows? Explain to me how Windows works. Now, if you've got an electrical engineer who'd spent uh, his or her career doing the national grid or something, so didn't know much about computers, and said, figure out how Windows works. I want to know. Um, well, uh, you might take the back off the computer and look, uh, and what you would see is, uh, you know, some silicon in there and some copper and some, some iron, uh, and you might be told, well, we're hot on the trail of how a computer works. It's something to do with those things. Well, uh, we know, of course, that that's referring to the hardware of the computer. I don't denigrate that. It's got to be made of stuff. So the chemical investigation of life's origin is the investigation of the hardware side. Uh, what we're looking at is the software side. It's the equivalent uh, for software. How did that software come to exist and what is its nature? Uh, and so you think, well, let's ask a computer scientist, John von Neumann. Now, he had, uh, many years ago, uh, by analogy with a Turing machine or a universal computer, the notion of a universal constructor, something that could construct anything, can construct anything within some class of objects, including itself. Uh, this uh, is a non-trivial type of replicator or constructor. Uh, trivial ones might be crystals, computer viruses, memes. You can see the list. Um, and these things replicate themselves uh, in a trivial way because the replication is already implicit in the underlying physics and chemistry. Whereas life is quite different. Life uh, is programmable. Uh, it, the living cell is very much like a von Neumann constructor. Uh, the DNA is a little bit like the tape. Uh, and one of the things about DNA is it uh, fulfills two roles. On the one hand is a physical object that just gets replicated, whatever it is, whatever the sequence. On the other hand, it's an object containing instructions for the cell to do things. And the cell has to have a supervisory unit uh, in, in order to, that's what von Neumann called it, in order to decide what role the DNA is, is taking. And that supervisory unit isn't located anywhere. You can't find it in the cell. It's distributed globally. So it's an example of top-down causation. I'll skip that slide. Um, but that's not all. Uh, as I've explained a couple of times, the information in a cell uh, is important because there is a molecular milieu that can interpret it uh, and act on its instructions. So biological information has, is something like functional or semantic or contextual information. And this flow of information goes from the DNA up to the cell. So that's an example of bottom-up. But we also know that in, in addition to this bottom-up from the genes going up to the organisms, there's the top-down flow of information. Uh, that is, that the organism as a whole can influence how, what is happening at the bottom level. Uh, I have a wonderful example here uh, in terms of uh, how electric fields can be used to uh, modify the structure of little worms called planaria, but I think I don't have time to do it justice. This is the work of Mike Levin at Tufts. Um, because I just want to mention in the last minute or so that I've got, um, the, uh, the way in which we are trying to understand top-down, you can ask me this in question time, it's, it's uh, very entertaining, um, about how we can model mathematically this thing called top-down causation. And Sarah Walker had the idea that all the major transitions in biology, including the transition from non-life to life, are characterised by a change in the information flow from bottom to top to a mixture of uh, bottom up and top down. And we've tried to model this with a couple of toy models uh, in the last one minute. I will just tell you that one of these is um, a cellular automaton, but different. Instead of having a fixed set of one of the 256 rules, uh, what we do is to let the state, the global state of the automaton, determine what the update rule is. And so this changes all the time. And so this is a way of coupling uh, global to local by coupling uh, the rules to the state in the manner I mentioned earlier. Uh, and lastly, uh, there's um, a better worked out model that Sarah did with my postdoc Luis Cisneros of a system of entities that obey the logistic equation. 
uh, but they're coupled to the mean field. This is the mean field, or the mean something. Uh, and the dynamics of this system is very sensitively dependent on the coupling constant epsilon. And the next picture I'm not going to talk you through, because I have only like 15 seconds, but I'm putting it up for purely artistic reasons. Uh, so this is the return map uh, for various values of epsilon, and it shows uh, a wide range of behavior. And, and the last, the very last slide I'm going to show you uh, is that uh, by using a quantity called the transfer entropy, uh, we are able to uh, give some quantitative measure of this transition from bottom-up to top-down information flow. This shows both. Uh, and what it means is that uh, for some values of epsilon, you find that the information is flowing from the, the global state, from the collective state, down to the local state. And from some other values, it flows in the other direction. And uh, this is closely re related to uh, the work we heard earlier uh, from uh, Tononi and his uh, group. Uh, uh, and that's about it. I'll, I'll put up the slide that these are the problems to crack. Uh, and I think we have to do changeover for, for Anita.